I will now introduce JB Pauline. JB Pauline is uh, at McGill and has been in every single neuroacademy, I believe, uh, since this started, pretty much. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing, but uh, JB's research uh, spans a lot of different things, including a very uh, he's he's really done a lot to promote reproducibility in neuroimaging through development of methods and um, development of organizations. And um, um, so the focus of his talk today will be in some sense reproducibility and particularly the, the implications of statistics on reproducibility. And with that, I'll hand it off to JB. Thanks uh, so much, Ariel. I must say, I uh, always enjoy being at the New York Academy. It's a <laughs> It's always, uh, it's not only, you know, a lot of content, it's also a lot of uh, uh, good people and intra good interactions. Uh, so I hope at some stage uh, you can experience those interactions despite the pandemic and the, uh, and the uh, remote system. I'm going to share my screen. I believe I have to first put myself on the presentation mode. Um, and uh, yeah, if I share my screen now. That should work. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, that's yeah. great. Okay, so let's get started. So, uh, so this is a talk and lecture, but I really would like and uh, would appreciate any interruption and any questions during the talk uh, and make it uh, possibly a little bit more of a discussion at some stage if you uh, if you are so inclined. Um, otherwise, what I plan to do today with you is go through a number of points that are I think are interesting to uh, review for uh, the aspect of uh, what do we do with our classical statistics and how uh, that is potentially a problem for reproducibility of our results in neuroimaging or actually in, you know it's a bit more general than uh, neuroimaging in uh, life sciences uh, I would say. So the first Point. And so you see the, my plan here, like uh, I'm going to talk about a number of little things like uh, the p-value problems and, uh, you know, p-hacking, five draw effect, winner, winner scores, and also a little bit of, a, you know, what's an effect size and, you know, the, uh, some thoughts on effect sizes and then power uh, positive predictive values and statistical generosity. So uh, in some of those topics, I will go very quickly. I just want to mention them and like, you know, give you a, a quick idea uh, if, you, if you don't have one already. Uh, um, so first of all, in terms of the definition aspect, I mean, you, I'm sure like as some of you already have seen uh, that uh, slide or this uh, uh, organization, uh, when we talk about reproducibility, we, we often talk about many things <laughs> and, uh, and often the, gen, you know, the, uh, the, the terminology is that if you take the same data and the same, uh, uh, the same pipeline, then you, have, you can reproduce and you can reproduce the result that's reproducibility in a restricted sense. Uh, but if you take another data set, that's really uh, talking about replicability. Uh, while if you uh, use the same data set, but with different pipelines, often people will refer that as uh, robustness of the results with respect to methods. But the, the way I would like uh, you and everyone to kind of think of that problem is really a generalizability problem where depending on what you change, uh, how much your result, your finding is actually going to be uh, 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 you know, uh, stable and, and, uh, and similar uh, with, uh, with changes of, uh, of dimensions like uh, pipelines, like data sets, like uh, uh, possibly time scanners, like, you know, there's many possible dimensions of, uh, of changes. And, and, and basically the way, the way to think of it is, uh, uh, will my finding hold uh, in a other context with that uh, specific context uh, changing? Uh, so replicability, uh, 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 reproducibility, sorry, in a strict sense uh, is, uh, is more like a computational aspect problem, but generalizability is much more like a statistical problem. Uh, and uh, and so the classical framework that I'm going to talk about doesn't really help us uh, often in that. Uh... So why am I talking about p-values when it's really boring, <laughs> if I'm sure, uh, for some of you? Uh, it's just like it's a very dominant framework and still a very dominant framework. And uh, despite all the efforts of uh, many people, uh, it, it seems that the, uh, the academic world is uh, a little bit uh, in this uh, 
in this uh, local minimum, <laughs> uh, if you want, uh, and it doesn't uh, really go out of it. I just want to point out the two uh, statistical framework for the p-value. One it was actually the, the way Fisher developed that in the, in the 1930s, or 20s actually, um, uh, was really more like, a, you know, sort of like, you know, okay, I want to have a vague idea of whether that's a, a reasonable, I mean, like something that I can trust or not. Uh, while the, the proper null hypothesis testing framework was developed by uh, Neyman and Pearson. And that's really like a, a decision-making framework. You have to set a threshold and yes, you take that decision A or that decision B, depending on whether you, you, you go over that threshold. But it's a much more solid uh, statistical framework. It's also, a, to some extent, a problematic statistical framework like a, because you, you take a decision and that uh, making that decision is, is inherently uh, kind of an epistemological problem. Uh, so a quick reminder, uh, hopefully no one really needs that reminder, but just, just like, you know, just to say that, you know, for the, uh, for, I mean, the, the way we control, what the, the error we control is the type one uh, alpha uh, positive error, which is uh, the framework where you have like, you, you hypothesize a null hypothesis, uh, and then you, you know, like you're computing a statistic, you're looking at that statistic and whether that's a, uh, um, it goes over a, a certain value or not, uh, and then you reject if it does. Uh, and then, and the and the way we do that uh, that test is really to try to control if we are under the null hypothesis. How many times are we going to be wrong if we uh, go over that threshold? And that's the 0.05 classical threshold that everybody knows. Um, I just want to take a one minute to uh, have you do a quick test, uh, if you want, uh, just to, and I'm sure you you. You all think you know what's a p-value, <laughs> and uh, and, pro and hopefully most of you do. Um, uh, but uh, but this is a test that was given to medical students, um, uh, and the test is as followed: uh, uh, you have a, a a drug study, a typical medical research study, uh, and you want to test the efficiency of a drug, and then you have a an hypothesis, a null hypothesis that there's no effect. Okay, a classical null hypothesis, and then you test against an alternative hypothesis that there is some effect. Okay, and uh, and suppose that the study uh, results uh, have a p-value of 0 0.05, less than 0 0.05, uh, in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Uh, can you uh, quickly tell me uh, what uh, has been shown? So uh, is H0 false? Is H1 true? Or is H0 probably false and H1 probably true? Or both uh, 1 and 2, so H0 false, H1 true, and uh, both or both 3 and 4, uh, probably false and, uh, and probably true? or uh, none of the above. So I don't know how to, uh, we can't actually do a quick uh, uh, survey here, but uh, I don't know if, uh, if there's a way of uh, pinging people on, on the, maybe on Slack or something, but uh, at least in your mind, uh, try to answer that question. Uh, I'll give you, uh, you know, uh, 15 seconds. Uh, Okay, so uh, maybe you have to make, make a remind. Uh, my bet, uh, and hopefully I'm wrong, uh, is that many of you will have at least, uh, you know, a number of you will have answered uh, uh, six, probably something like that. You know, six would be like a, you know, visible like a, okay, there's a p value point less than 0.05, probably H0 is wrong and, and is false, and probably H1 is true. Uh, but the problem is that, and that's what uh, medical students answer. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like uh, uh, 36 people, uh, 30, 36 pe uh, percent of the, uh, uh, the students cohort here uh, answered the answer six. And, uh, you know, a number of them answered uh, three and uh, four. Um, and of, and the, the actual answer is uh, seven. That's uh, none of the above. And that's because we, we have a wrong conception of what is p-value. We don't, we don't actually, you know, uh, uh, see clearly what it means because it's a bit of a you know twisted framework in in some sense, um, and the reason why it's because uh, basically when you're talking about the p-value and you're saying okay uh, you know I, I reject the null, you're not actually giving a probability on the null at all. You're giving uh, a probability on on some statistics of the data under the null, and that's a, a big difference. So. First of all, you have to, uh, if you give a probability on the, on, of the null, you have to probabilize, like you have to make that, a, a prob you know, like a random variable. Uh, so the null hypothesis would be a random variable, which it can be, uh, you know, it's, it's not like the uh, wrong framework, um, but, uh, but in that classical sense, uh, you, know, you know, like in the frequentist uh, world, 
uh, you would probably just have a, a, a zero is either true or false. Uh, you know, it's a, and it's you are either under a zero or under H one, and that's it. You know, and then, so there's no probability attached to that. Um, so, so I think, uh, yeah. So that's the um, none of the above is the actual you know, answer that was hoping, um, and. Uh, and you know it's uh, it's you have to think of the definition of a p value which is the probability of observing a statistic equal or more extreme to the one seen in the data when the null is true okay and that's that is really that's the probability of observing statistic of the data so and what's a statistic it's just a function of the data any any function of the data is a statistic so you, you compute the mean or you compute the standard deviation anything that's a stat uh, and that's uh, and then you're looking at that probability of that stat uh, under the null uh, and it requires quite a bit of a, you know, there's a baggage there, you know, uh, that is not always uh, well, uh, you know, seen and understood as well. So it requires a full knowledge of the null, of course, the choice of the stats, which is uh, an important one. But it's also have the concept of the frequentist concept that you have to be able to imagine the the uh, the uh, the study being repeated under the null like an infinite number of times. So with the same design study, same sampling scheme, everything the same. So even that is a bit unrealistic in some ways. It's like it's a model, it's a conception, right? Um, so <laughs> I found that that quote from Neiman in person, which <laughs> you know is uh, is which which say uh, you know just to uh, reinforce what uh, the survey was uh, was telling us. Uh, we are inclined to think that as far as the particular hypothesis is concerned, no test based upon the theory of probability can by itself provide valuable evidence on the truth or falsehood of a hypothesis. So it it really confirms what you know like in the Neiman and Pearson framework, uh, you know you don't you don't you don't uh, you don't probabilize probably probabilize uh, sorry the uh, the null or the alternative you you might uh, that's not that's, those are things that are not uh, random variables. So uh, those are a couple of uh, p values associated with uh, you know some distribution. So I don't know if you see my mouse here, but. Uh, uh, this is like a, for like a you know p equal point one uh, five nine uh, if you you know normal distribution z is greater than one and uh, if it's a gamma distribution then uh, you know you have to have uh, the the statistic being greater than three point seven uh, and I just want to reinforce also the fact that uh, the p value under the null. Uh, First of all, it's a statistic. It's a, it's something you compute as a function of the data, right? Uh, so it's a statistic as other statistic, <laughs> uh, and uh, and it has a and and because it's a function of the data, and you imagine your data being random, there's some randomness in it, or your model thinks as uh, the noise as uh, or some some kind of noise as random. Um, then then you can actually look at the distribution of that p-value, uh, which is a statistic, uh, under, under the null. And under the null, by definition, a p-value is uniform. So that's just a quick uh, simulation showing that, you know, so whatever the null is, uh, under the null, your p-value is, is a random variable that has a uniform distribution under the null. And uh, I won't go into the detail why that's uh, uniform, but I've, I've put, I actually pushed my slides on the uh, repo uh, RL, so whenever you want to uh, you know, merge that, uh, you, you can uh, read, uh, read that slide a bit uh, more in detail and, and, and try to understand why that's the case. But it's really uh, almost inherent to the, uh, to the definition of, of what the p-value is. Uh, uh, which is, it's worth taking a bit of time to, you know, like uh, looking at that. There's also some formal uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's easy to demonstrate formally as well, but, uh, but just to give you an intuition what that's the case, I think you can read that slide carefully um, uh, in your own time. Um, so one thing that I just want to point out is that there is uh, an interesting way of, uh, I, I'll, I'll talk soon about p-hacking and uh, probably some of you have already, uh, 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 heard the term, uh, but the, there's an interesting way of of, uh, of determining if there is p hacking in in some field and, and in a field, for instance, the field of uh, you know neuroimaging, for instance, uh, you know, and the and the way to uh, define um, determine if you if you if there is p hacking in neuroimaging is actually using the fact that you know the uh, the p value under the null uh, is uh, uniformly distributed. Yeah. So what's, what are the common problems? I mean, two uh, common problems are being uh, uh, highlighted in this uh, publication, for instance, uh, that I've cite, I'm citing here. Uh, first of all, the most common error uh, and, the, uh, and probably the most serious is to consider the p-value as the probability of uh, the null hypothesis, of, uh, so that, is, uh, that the null hypothesis is true. 
so that's we've seen why that's not the case, but uh, just like repeating uh, uh, this fact. And um, and the other uh, problem often is that uh, let's say you have a, a situation where uh, you uh, you conduct uh, like a clinical trial, for instance, and with a controlled type one error uh, of a test, uh, and let's say say five percent, and you have like a good power. And I'll go over those notions of power things, but let's say you have a good situation in terms of detecting an effect. Um, then uh, if you have significant results and the idea is that uh, that corresponds to a true difference between the treatments that are being compared in that uh, clinical trial. And that's actually not always the case. And I want to go through that because it's not uh, obvious. It's not directly obvious, I think. Uh, uh, but let's say you have a null a thousand null hypotheses and that's, you know, and again, in your imaging, we often have like a, a number of uh, null hypotheses. So it's uh, interesting to, uh, uh, for instance, you know, thousand brain regions or thousand voxels or like a genetic thousand SNPs or whatever. And, um, and, uh, and then you have made say 10% of those null are false. So in 10% of those brain regions, there is actually some, some signal. Uh, in the rest, it's, uh, it, it should be you know, purely noise. Uh, then, you know, if you, then therefore you have 900 of true hypotheses, uh, uh, null hypotheses, okay, where it's only noise. And then uh, if you do a test at 5% uh, risk of error under the null, which is we are in this, in this branch, uh, you'll find some uh, 45 significant results uh, because, because of the pure randomness of things. So if you, if, let's say you don't, you know, multiple comp uh, comparison, you don't do any multiple comparison. So you find some uh, uh, 44, 45, and then the rest is uh, non-significant, okay. And then if you go on the side of where there's uh, the 10% of those hypotheses that are actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, under H1, um, then you have, uh, and then because you have, you know, like a, a power of detection of 80%, uh, you, you will find 80%, 80 uh, significant results, so true positive here, uh, and 45 uh, false positive. And then, you know, uh, if you take those two numbers, uh, you have therefore 80 of 125, so two thirds of the uh, results that are significant are, uh, are true positive. And that's uh, two thirds is, is kind of low, you know, if you're in, in that setting. And it's not always obvious, you know, that that's the case. Uh, and we'll, I'll go over that a little bit more with the, what's, uh, what we've just computed here is actually some sort of, some form of the uh, positive predictive value that is interesting to, uh, uh, to reflect upon. So just to summarize quickly, p-value can indicate how incompatible the data are with the specific statistical model, the null hypothesis, which is what it, does very well and is good too for that. Uh, they do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true. We've seen that, and the scientific conclusion and policy decisions uh, should not be based only on the on, on p value. And that's uh, often a bit of a you know uh, a quick shortcut that people are taking, which is uh, problematic. Um, and the and uh, and a couple of other things like uh, you know, if you report p value, you really have to report the full way uh, you are computing those things and and all the p values, all the computation that you've done. Uh, and I'll go over that again with the p hacking problem. Um, they do not measure the effect size, uh, the importance of results, uh, and they do not provide a good uh, measure of evidence regarding model uh, or hypothesis. I think I, we, yeah, we've covered that. So what is p-hacking that I'm, uh, I've been referring to? Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a classical thing. It, it, you have to think of it as in the context of, let's say, academia, where it is important to publish things uh, for your career. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, you get some data, you've got some ideas what you would like to have from the, uh, of, uh, you know, like if you have some, some sort of a general hypothesis or a possibly precise hypothesis, and then you uh, analyze the data in a number of ways. And then, you know, at suddenly, at some stage in the analysis, you find that, uh, you know, if you have that covariate and that normalization and that sort of specific pipeline, you do find something that is interesting because it is, and there's the p-value that is less than 0.05, uh, you know, possibly corrected, whatever. Um, and that's, uh, and the fact that you have used many uh, pipelines and many analysis is obviously the fact that, you know, is, is the problem that uh, you are increasing the false positive rate uh, using that uh, thing. And what uh, Simonson, Simons and Simonson have done is that they actually studied the, uh, uh, you know, some psychology literature. They looked at, you know, how, uh, 
uh, psychologists were analyzing the data uh, and they took all the ways they do uh, that those analyses uh, in good faith uh, you know you you know the way um, you analyze data and you know you're thinking okay i forgot that uh, aspect that maybe i don't get resolved because of x or because of y and so on and and uh, and the way uh, and they looked at all those ways in the literatures and then they push uh, null uh, uh, data without any effect in those uh, pipelines and they looked at how much uh, uh, tap one error they, they get from the various ways of uh, psychologists were analyzing data. And, uh, and they find like an increase of a type one error of 30%, 50%, sometimes 60%, like up to, I mean, like 60% of type one errors you know, uh, so in, for some of those uh, behavior where, you know, like uh, you, uh, maybe you leave out some of the data, maybe you, uh, you know, you, uh, you test uh, several interactions, whatever. Uh, and um, so the thing is that as soon as you look at the data, as soon as you start to visualize some things and uh, uh, you have some kind of some in some ways used some data and therefore anything that you you know anything that may be based on that uh, of what you've seen uh, is dented and and is actually uh, will have uh, an impact on the false positive rate uh, so uh, so that's the problem of p-hacking and i would say that you know in uh, most of the time it's you it's done in entirely good faith uh, you know like people are thinking oh i forgot that effect or i forgot this thing and uh, and it's not it's not absolutely not uh, uh, you know like a scientific fraud of some kind it's just a, you know a, a, a problem of how people analyze data and it's not very clear uh, you know what uh, uh, how it should be done um, so the p-hacking test is, as, as I said, is, is based on the fact that, you know, the, the p-values are, uh, are, are uh, uniformly distributed. And if you look at the literature, uh, you will, uh, if you look at uh, how, the, how many p-values are close to 0.05 and how many p-values are close to 0.001 and 0.0001 and so on, under the null, you should have a flat uh, distribution, okay? Uh, if you have some signals, uh, so if you do have some signal, then you would probably have like a, a smaller p-value, uh, a, a, a larger number, you will have a larger number of smaller p-values. So the, the distribution will go up if you want uh, with the uh, with small value, and then maybe go down if there's not enough uh, data, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, but we, it should go up. But if you have a distribution that says, okay, there's a lot of p-values that are at uh, point oh, point oh 0.049, for instance, uh, uh, you know, uh, then then you have like a, the, the effect of p-hacking uh, because you have like too many p-values that are close to 0.05 compared to uh, to other. Uh, so that's uh, that's the way you detect things. Uh, so that's interesting if you want to have a look at that. So what are the solutions? So the classical one, you probably fully, uh, many of you know, is a pre-registration. It's actually quite a hard exercise where you, uh, uh, before analyzing the data and possibly before acquiring the data, uh, you uh, lay out exactly your hypothesis and exactly your uh, uh, your methods and, uh, and and exactly how you're going to test things. And you don't, you know, do anything else in terms of if you want to have inference on what you are you're going to uh, uh, report. If you I mean, you can always explore things. It's just a way that you have to report that this is an exploration. I can't actually, actually, you know, like uh, uh, do some proper statistical inference there. I just explore things, and this is what I, I observe. But you know, I don't, I'm not, you know, doing any conclusion of, of that. And there are many other ways people have thought about, uh, like uh, dealing with that problems. Uh, some uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there was a lot of consortium or groups of researchers wanting to uh, change the uh, the uh, Alpha, because they thought, okay, alpha is uh, too small, and indeed it is quite small. Uh, if we back in, in uh, some context, uh, or, but definitely uh, what we want to have is not only the p-value and all those things, but we want to have all the full reporting of uh, the effect size, the confidence interval, and all those things. And that's uh, that's one way of. Um, uh, so um, another effect that I want you to know about, I'm sure, uh, hopefully you already, some of you do, is the problem of the file drawer. And, uh, and that's the problem of the publication filter aspect, if you want. So that, uh, if you don't have a p-value less than 0.05, then, uh, then that uh, report or that uh, results are as, as less, uh, less chance to be actually published uh, in the literature. Uh, so it was in effect reported a long time ago by uh, Rosenthal. And, um, and, you know, and, and it is also the, you know, like uh, due to the pressure of, uh, of uh, 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 publishing uh, significant results and uh, and sometimes uh, 
uh, yeah, uh, you know, non-significant result will have a hard time to find a place in the literature, or, or possibly, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, with less prominent journals or whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the so the problem is, I think, it's still uh, quite uh, heavily, uh, you know, there, and uh, uh, to some extent. Uh, uh, you know, it's also almost there also in the uh, in the machine learning literature, which is interesting, uh, but I, I won't go, go over that. So just, just to show you uh, the actual thing, right? Uh, if you look at the distribution of the Z value uh, in uh, 1 million uh, uh, Z values reported by Medline, uh, this is the distribution that you find. Uh, so nothing <laughs> like a, with this big gap uh, in the middle between the minus two and two uh, because of the 0.05 distribution, uh, you know, uh, statistical threshold uh, in a normal distribution with that. Uh, that uh, so I, I find that, uh, uh, and also, you know, like a, an obvious bias for like a positive, uh, to test are more down in the, posi in the positive uh, direction. Uh, yeah, <laughs> interesting. Um, so, the effect, the five draw effect is an actual effect. It's not something that you <laughs> cannot be measured. It's, it's there and you can see it uh, quite, quite vividly. Um, uh, so yeah, again, pre-distribution and the thing. One thing that uh, I really want you to understand, and I'll go over that again when we talk about, quickly about power and the, you know, the, uh, the capacity of detection of a small effect or, or an effect, um, is that uh, reporting null uh, no result is is really important as we've seen. Like you know, it, uh, and we see why as well. It, it also biases the effect sizes and all those things. But uh, the problem uh, I would say is uh, uh, we uh, you know if we don't have good detection power, then reporting a null result uh, doesn't mean anything. Doesn't give you inf any information, right? Uh, so if you, let's say you have uh, like, uh, three subjects in, in the neuroimaging and, uh, and you're asking for like, a, you know, whether with three subjects I can detect uh, that uh, small uh, activation in the brain or like, you know, difference into the fiber tracts or whatever. Uh, and you don't have any power. So detecting, like a reporting that they, you don't find any result doesn't, doesn't give us, give the literature any information at all. Uh, uh, so, so uh, only when there is power, there is uh, a, a capacity of detection. Only when that's uh, interesting to report another result. And in that case, it is actually very important and interesting to report another result. Um, a quick uh, word on the uh, what is uh, classically referred as, as the uh, winner's curse. Um, in the, uh, so, so what is it? Um, it's the association. It's the fact that uh, associations passing predetermined threshold of a statistical threshold, uh, significance tend to overestimate the size of the effect. Uh, so, uh, and especially when the size of the study is small and uh, when the threshold is stringent. Um, so um, uh, that's uh, that's the effect. Uh, so, uh, so I'll read it again. So, if you if you have a, a predetermined threshold. Uh, and you uh, you report only those those effects that are going over that threshold, uh, then uh, you will overestimate in general the effect, which it's it's kind of a common sense, right? Uh, you just have a threshold, and therefore you report only the big ones, and therefore you overestimate because you won't report the small ones. Okay, uh, so so it, you have to uh, have a predetermined threshold. So uh, small sample size is really important because you have then a, a bad estimation, and then the estimation can be high for uh, just by randomness. Uh, and then a stringent threshold will only report like a very high uh, effect sizes. Um, so uh, I, yeah, I, I should have included the slide here, uh, but uh, hopefully I will have, yeah, I, sorry, uh, I'm missing a slide, but uh, I, will, I will probably show you the effect uh, uh, later on. Um, so uh, I want to go back to quick, uh, uh, a quick uh, sort of a, uh, uh, recall of what is the reminder of what is the effect size, and uh, and I think you all know in the sort of like a classical uh, sort of like two groups, uh, let's say mean of two groups of group one, mean of group two, uh, FX size should be something like the mean, the difference between the mean. Okay, that's is that's easy. That's the rule effect size. Uh, the uh, the classical way people report effect size is to standardize those that difference uh, using uh, using uh, the standard deviation of the data. And that's 
just can I just reemphasize of the data, <laughs> you know, and not of the means, uh, and that's the uh, and that's uh, you know if you if you want to standardize by the by the uh, by the standardization of the means or, if, uh, or or you know like uh, you take into account the number of uh, sample you have in your in your study and therefore you have this uh, square root of uh, of, of n uh, somewhere. So for instance, the z value uh, is a kind of a standardized uh, fx size as well if you want, but that's that's one that takes into account on the sample size of the uh, of the study, uh, so so that um, uh, those uh, that sample size uh, which is not uh, which is independent of the size of the studies, it's, it's kind of important to report as well because you know you're, like the P, like the z value or the p value are just like you know one to one mapping to between those two things uh, once you've chosen the null um, and and therefore it doesn't give you more information. Uh, but the but the but knowing the standard deviation of the data themselves and the, uh, and the and therefore the uh, uh, the Cohen's d effect size, for instance, uh, do, does give you uh, more information. Uh, so what is what is good to report and what's a good effect size? Uh, anything can be a good effect size. It's it's really uh, you know, what you think is important for people to know about your study and your results. Uh, uh, and uh, in general, the simpler, the more interpretable, the more uh, with uh, specific uh, units that are understood, understood by the community, uh, standard in your field, uh, the better. And that's, uh, but it can be anything like a percentage of variance explained by a model is a classical effect size, for instance, so correlation, difference between means, of course, and so on. Uh, so, uh, so the idea is that really, uh, uh, we should report as much as we can of the information uh, and that's, uh, particularly important for the meta-analysis. I know that NG has talked to you about uh, meta-analysis. It's also very important that those reported uh, effect size are uh, well done uh, in, uh, in, in papers. Uh, most journals now, will, I mean, will ask you for specific uh, reporting of effect size. There's the COVIDAS uh, uh, you know, uh, initiative that is trying to normalize those things and to, uh, to say, hey, this is what you have to report. Uh, usually, you would be asked to report uh, confidence uh, intervals, for instance, or uh, credible intervals if you are in the deviation framework, uh, and so on. What I would recommend is as much as you can, and it's kind of like a natural and uh, you know common sense thing, is uh, if you can do some bootstrapping uh, of your data in some simple ways, uh, uh, and if that's not too computationally intensive, you can actually just have some kind of an idea of the distributions of your results, uh, your FX sizes, and uh, and, uh, and I think that's that's definitely always worth doing for yourself and and for the literature, but uh, at least for yourself. Uh, I don't know if I'm, let me check the timing a little bit. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll go over that uh, quick example. So it's a it's an old study. Um, it was one when the field of uh, imaging genetics started really, uh, and it was look uh, that study was looking at the uh, uh, at the uh, uh, you know like a it's depending on the allele you have on uh, one of your uh, serotonin transporter uh, gene, uh, uh, the uh, the way the amygdala would light up in your in a uh, in a fearful versus non fearful faces uh, would be uh, 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 you know would be different. So so the study is you have more fMRI signal in the amygdala uh, when you're carrying the uh, uh, the uh, one of the uh, uh, the long. Uh, the long, uh, you know, uh, one one allele of, uh, you know, or, or not, uh, on on that certain transporter gene. So it's very in interesting uh, question, and the and the author reported uh, some variation of some uh, different means uh, for the two groups, like uh, with the uh, the two uh, uh, genetic groups, like uh, with the. Uh, uh, long carrier of the uh, certain transporter and the short carrier, and. Um, and with a small, very small uh, cohort at the time, that was, uh, you know, still, uh, I think, uh, possible. Uh, it's not uh, that wouldn't be published now. Um, and the and the question is, how do they, uh, how do you compute the effects? This is the information that you get in the paper and plus the p-value. Uh, but you, how do you compute the effects? So you have to go back a little bit and you know, like, I do a little bit of a forensic analysis. So I took, for instance, here the uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, the standard division of the mean that was reported, uh, computed the standard division of the data from the standard division of the mean, uh, and then you know uh, with a easy formula you find you you weigh you know, there are ways of like uh, combining those things across groups, uh, and then once you have that 
you can compute the coherency. And the coherency that uh, computed for this study was a uh, coherency of one, uh, which is, you know, in psychology would be considered as a very strong effect, extremely strong effect. Um, um, and, uh, and if I go a bit further in the kind of like, you know, forensic analysis of that paper, and, and again, it takes some time to actually, you know, like uh, uh, uncover and, uh, and, you know, and, and, and do those little computations, uh, I was able to actually recover the percentage of variance explained by that simple model of uh, the difference between those two means. And, uh, and it's not a complicated computation, but it has to be done. And, um, and you find like uh, that's 40% uh, that's of the board signal is explained by those two, uh, uh, the difference between this, uh, this allele. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's a very very strong uh, effect size. So uh, so the question is really is that effect size would, would be replicated or not? And I think I, it, I, I don't think it would actually. Uh, in terms of replication effect size, uh, there's this classical by Nozick study. You know, looking at uh, almost 100 uh, psychological experiment and reaction times, and uh, showing that uh, most of the effect sizes are actually. Uh, uh, not only below uh, the original effect size reported, so everything that is below that uh, diagonal line has a, a replication effect size less than the original effect size, uh, and uh, all the red dots here have also like a non-significant uh, replicated effect size, if you want. Uh, I found also an interesting study going beyond that uh, original thing that uh, some of you have probably heard about, uh, which is the fact that, uh, in fact, the difference between the original effect size, uh, which is the uh, uh, and the and the replicated effect size here, okay, in on uh, on the x-axis. Sorry, on the on on the um, uh, y-axis you have the uh, the difference, and uh, on the x-axis you have the original study correlation or, or Fisher Z, and um, and you see this uh, the difference. The, the actual statistical uh, significance of the difference is often not there. So you, even, even if you replicate and you find that uh, you don't replicate, it doesn't mean much uh, that you, uh, you find like a non-significant effect size because the difference between the two effect sizes are actually not significant themselves. themselves. So it's an interesting twist on that uh, study that uh, is not uh, often seen. So what if n is very large and you have like a, a lot of a, a potential of detection? Uh, then sometimes uh, another issue of the p of the uh, classical p-value aspect is that uh, you will find minuscule uh, effects uh, because of this uh, square root of n <laughs> that you've seen, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the computation of the z-value and therefore the p-value. Like, uh, and uh, and I think that's also uh, one thing that you should be aware of. And you know, if you if you're analyzing like a uh, GCP or UK Biobank or like you know like a ABCD data set, um, you know finding the right uh, the null hypothesis that is saying hey above that value the uh, effect uh, will be interesting and not uh, not only if it's different by of zero because you know with like a very very large number of subjects you know uh, even a, a trivial uh, variation for reason that you know, like uh, can be almost anything uh, will be significant, but is it uh, interesting and biologically and, uh, you know, significant or of interest? That's the problem. So a lot of what I've said rely on the on the aspect of power, really. Uh, and just to remind people uh, that, uh, you know, power is uh, this uh, one minus the type two error, uh, which is the uh, error that you do when you uh, use uh, you you don't actually uh, you don't reject the hypothesis when uh, when actually the uh, the alternative is true when you do have signal, um, so so that uh, so that the power is the, like you know, the capacity of detection aspect is really relying on a lot of things. Uh, first of all, it, it's relying on the fact. So here, for instance, in blue is my null distribution. Okay, uh, in red is the uh, threshold, a statistical threshold uh, that uh, the type one statistical threshold. So anything, so if I, if my statistic go on the right of that uh, uh, vertical line, I will declare uh, you know, uh, significance. Um, and you, and power is the integration of the alternative hypothesis here, uh, look at uh, this uh, green curve uh, and all the, you know, the integral of those, that surface here is telling you uh, how much power, how much likely I am going to be to reject an error. Uh, if uh, if I am under the alternative, uh, and you see that you know the, that uh, power can uh, you know vary quite a lot with a number of things. So first of all, you will vary of course with the statistical threshold, and there'll be less power if you have like a more stringent threshold, 
uh, it will vary if you, uh, for instance, if the green uh, curve is on is shifted on the on the left, and you have like a smaller effect size, of course, uh, uh, it will also vary if you decide that the null is not actually the null that you want. For instance, I was suggesting that the null could be the null of anything that is above, uh, you know, like a you know a small effect. So the blue uh, distribution could be shifted on the right as well, um, and uh, and the number of subjects will actually give you the variance. So the uh, the the the, uh, the width of this uh, of those distribution and therefore increase the uh, the gray area. Um, so it's a key measure. But it's a very difficult measure to compute. Uh, uh, it's uh, because you know uh, first of all it's key because without good power it's really not worth doing the study. You're not you know thinking that you're going to you know, like uh, you know it doesn't mean you know, you're not going to plan a study with three subjects because you know that you're not going to detect anything. Um, uh, and the other thing is that uh, I'll, I'll go with the uh, positive predictive value is that without good power, the study results are doubtful. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, so it's a hard measure to get on, uh, uh, but it's such an important one that uh, uh, even the attempt of uh, estimating that power is, is an interesting attempt. It will give you insight on, on your study for sure. Uh, and yeah, and I think that's that's uh, one of the really key figures that we, uh, I can't uh, I can't show enough. I think uh, that's the uh, it's an old one. Um, uh, it's the uh, on the y-axis here. You've got the effect size of the uh, uh, of the association between a, a begin F uh, a variant and the and the hippocampal volume. So depending on what allele you have on begin F uh, on the begin F uh, gene, you and the hippocampal volume. So so what's the association uh, with those two between those two things? And you know, and and on the x-axis, you see the year of publication of that association, uh, and the uh, the size of the circles here represent the size of the cohorts. So like uh, the the larger the circle, the, the greater the number of subjects included in the study. Um, and so you see like a early reports go a bit over over the place with a small cohort uh, and and but you know potentially very high effect sizes like for instance coins d of one uh, you know uh, almost one here uh, so high effect sizes small cohorts uh, early in the and the uh, kind of like a, a process of uh, of you know investigating that uh, association in the scientific community and then and then you increase the size of the cohort, the effects size tend to go down, uh, and then up, go down up to a point where it's not clear anymore whether there's actually an effect size at all. And then, uh, and that's and that that sort of trend is a very classical one, like a you know, early, a bit uh, you know surprising results, uh, like with a uh, uh, possibly driven partly by the winner's curse and possibly with uh, you know uh, and the fibro effects and all those things. And then and then you know when things are you know. Uh, 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 studied, uh, you know, in, in details and with like a large cohort, then you, you know, you, you get uh, less uh, less important effect sizes, possibly null effect size. <laughs> and that's uh, something uh, just on, uh, thinking about power and things. And like uh, you probably have seen that slide and that study uh, before, but that that was the number of subjects required in the neuroimaging analysis uh, to have eighty percent power. Uh, for what's the effect size of the uh, of the uh, you know the uh, the average or the median uh, uh, sample size? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, if you take the medium sample size of uh, neuroimaging uh, analysis uh, studies, uh, take the medium sample size, and that's about twenty five subjects in two thousand sixteen. Uh, uh, take the uh, look at how much uh, what is the uh, coins D that you can detect uh, with uh, eighty percent power. And, uh, and that graph shows the evolution of that uh, that thing, that uh, effect size, uh, detectable effect size with 80% uh, uh, with, uh, you know, with, with years of, uh, uh, and you see that uh, in 2016, there's, you know, you could detect with like the median effect uh, sample size of your study, you could detect something close to uh, an coincidence of one. Um, and when uh, Paul Drack and others uh, look at uh, uh, the effect size that you find in the HCP data set, you don't actually find one. And uh, even with like, you know, uh, motor cortex, uh, you know, uh, SMA activity, which is very, very strong, uh, it's a 0.7. So even like, uh, you know, basic, very strong effects uh, are, uh, you know, not usually detectable with a high power. Yeah. So um, I'd like to go now and quickly uh, 
discuss the what is called the positive predictive value, uh, and uh, and the reason uh, I got interested in that uh, sort of a measure uh, is is uh, is mostly because the originally because of the uh, uh, the seminal uh, publication of uh, John Yannidis, why must be publi uh, published research findings are false, which is a, a kind of like a, a, a almost like a simulation. There's no there's no data in that paper, but it's a very important one. Um, and the, uh, so the, the, what is the positive predictive value? It's the probability that the alternative is true knowing that the test is significant. So you have a significant test, and now you are putting yourself in a Bayesian framework, uh, which uh, uh, we'll you know, remind you quickly um, of, but uh, you're putting yourself in the Bayesian framework and you're asking, uh, so now things, uh, uh, hypotheses now are probable or not probable. Um, and, then you, and you're asking whether that, uh, uh, that thing is uh, that uh, the uh, H1 is probable if you if you have seen if you have measured uh, a significant test. Um, uh, so uh, when I say probable, uh, I just want to remind people that there are different definitions of probabilities and framework of thinking of those things. Uh, and I won't go over that. It's just that the uh, the classical way is the frequentist way, which is the limit of frequency across random trials. Uh, but there's uh, the, the one we are using here is the Bayesian one. Uh, and the Bayesian one, uh, defini by definition, uh, is uh, has this uh, uh, this property that uh, the probability of two co-occurring uh, co events are the uh, probability of the first one times the probability of the second one given the first one, and that's that's a, you know like a uh, in most of the uh, the cases it will be you know part of the definition of what is probability, uh, and, and from there you derive immediately the uh, the base the base uh, theorem, uh, which is there. So like for instance, you know the probability of a uh, hypothesis and the data conjointly as the uh, probability of the hypothesis knowing the data times the probability of the data, whatever that, that means. Um, and, uh, and, and same thing if you can, and can revert data and hypothesis, of course, and you can derive from there the uh, classical Bayesian uh, theorem, uh, which I, I'm, yeah, I think most of you will know. And just to give you an intuition, what's, it's, it, it looks always a bit puzzling. I mean, uh, you know, like a long time ago when I was thinking, okay, what's, what, what does it mean? Uh, like, uh, and, um, uh, and I think one way of seeing it easily and to understand like intuitively what's the uh, what's the Bayesian framework uh, is to look at uh, the, the, like a, let's say you have a spam emails and free lunch emails uh, and there's a number of them that are you know uh, both uh, spam and free lunch uh, then the the probability of uh, of uh, being a free lunch. Uh, 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 you know it's it's uh, knowing that. Uh, 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 knowing B, uh, the uh, probability of a spam, sorry, knowing that it, it has free lunch in the uh, in the subject of the email, for instance, is uh, simply the int uh, the intersection of the two uh, ensemble uh, normalized by the number of free lunch. So that's a that's very easy to kind of like understand intuitively what what that is. Uh, so it's so don't be afraid of Bayesian framework if you uh, if you don't if you haven't uh, touched it yet too much. Um, so why is the PPV so important? Uh, because if you don't have a strong, uh, high PPV, probability of uh, positive value, uh, then you have the like, probability of your uh, alternative hypothesis to be true is going to be small, even if the test is significant. And that's the problem. Uh, so, so the problem, the other problem is that it's, uh, it's really hard to compute. I told you how, uh, you know, like you need to know a lot of things to compute the power uh, and then you know by well but to compute the ppv you know not only you have to know not only the power uh, the risk of error that uh, you set so that's uh, easy but you also have to have some kind of prior this you know idea of uh, how much uh, your hypothesis are you know likely to be true or not uh, the null and, and the ratio of the null and the, so i won't derive that but it's very easy to derive so i, I just want to you to sh to first look at the uh, the you know, the, what is the formula for the PPV? Uh, and, and frankly, you know, it, you don't need much stats and math at all to derive that. So I just wanted to show that it's very simple to derive, making like three lines with like very basic, uh, very, very basic uh, things. You can derive the, you know, this uh, formula for the uh, positive predictive value. So what is the formula? It is power times odd ratio. Odd ratio is the, uh, the ratio of the, the prior properties of the alternative for the null. Um, and uh, 
uh, on the numerator and on the denominator divided by the same thing plus your type one error. That's kind of like a very simple formula, okay. Uh, and the and the interesting aspect is to look at you know what if you change uh, so with a reasonable odd ratio like you know so the alternative hypothesis is like a, is not a super probable but it's not super improbable either like you know uh, compared to the null uh, you know like a, with uh, with power of uh, let's say 0.3 for instance uh, you have only half you know half of the times that you find the statistical test significant you will have your alternative hypothesis uh, true. Uh, and if you if you have p hacking, for instance, uh, and if you like, have the same you know prior ratio, uh, which is you know, like uh, not unreasonable, uh, then uh, then you know if if you have a small power, then you have like you know a very dire uh, situation where you, you know you you're almost sure that you know like it's very it's going to be very rare to have the the alternative hypothesis to be true in that context. Uh, uh, yeah, and you can vary the odd ratio and all those things to uh, you know, play with those things. But but I think that's uh, kind of like a justifies, uh, what justifies uh, UNAV's papers in some sense is that uh, uh, when when Button et al, for instance, look at the power of neuroscience experiments, uh, they, they did find that the uh, kind of like the uh, median power was, uh, was uh, something like a 40 or 30 percent. So that's, uh, you know, like a, you know, so basically most many, many neuroscience experiments are not well powered enough and therefore the PPV and therefore the kind of like the reproducibility or, you know, like a generalizability, uh, replicability aspect of those things are, is, is, uh, is doubtful. I just want to say that uh, PPV in the context of machine learning and testing is also uh, what is called precision. Uh, and if you, it's a different statistical framework, but it, it can be easily related. Those two things can be re easily related. And, and you remember if my kind of experiment with a thousand uh, uh, hypothesis, then you, know, you just uh, have to uh, look at the PPV as the number of true positive divided by the number of positive. So uh, including the, the true plus the false. Uh, yeah, it's a, a quick uh, slide to remind you that there's also the negative predictive value, which is an interesting uh, uh, thing to compute, uh, can be computed in terms of the uh, test and uh, machine learning test, for instance, uh, well, detection or not, um, but, uh, uh, and also sensitivity specificity aspect. Uh, so I like that. Uh, uh, I think it's Wikipedia should have put the credit there. So to summary is a summary. It's hard to compute the PPV uh, because it is power, which is hard to compute, and prior odds that are kind of like you know uh, you have to give your best guess or guess, give several best guess. Uh, but it's it's really interesting to know uh, to have those estimates. And the last point, which I yeah, I think I will go very 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 quickly over, is the statistical generalizability, and that's really the point that uh, Tal Yarkoni makes in, in his uh, uh, generalizability crisis paper, which I should have uh, cited, which I will, um, uh, and he's basically saying, hey, you know, if you model things with random effect versus fixed effect, uh, you have like a very different way, very different uh, estimation of the uh, intervals of a confidence interval. Uh, and that's uh, and that basically is to say, think of what effects you should be random and what effects should be fixed, and that's not always an easy, uh, uh, you know, decision sometimes. Uh, and the and the way people think of uh, what is random and what is fixed in uh, in uh, linear models is uh, is not everywhere the same. Um, but but basically, uh, you know, in, in that context, you know, the uh, is it was very clear for like a simulated Stroop effect, for instance, that the uh, the subject effect should be random. And that fixed, and that um, yeah, um, yeah. That's uh, all what I wanted to say. Uh, so just uh, you know, like uh, as a conclusion, like as be aware that. Uh, uh, it is important to understand our classical testing framework. Uh, it is also important to know about the, uh, the effects that you have in the literature and uh, uh, just at least to try to avoid those things uh, for ourselves. Uh, uh, so, yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thanks, JB. That was really great. Um, let's open this up for a few questions if people have any. I guess what's the good news? What do you mean? What's the good news? <laughs> I think I think the good news is that uh, there is more and more uh, 
data sharing and data mm -hmm. and capacity to get data from many uh, sources. And I think there will be, uh, and there is already uh, some push by the reviewers and the journal that to say, mm -hmm. hey, why don't you try to also replicate on that uh, data set? You remember, remember Ariel, when the, you know, like a, a, uh, in the genomic uh, field, for instance, uh, the, I mean, all the GWAS, the, the first GWAS were actually uh, not replicable. I mean, like most of them were not replicated. Uh, and, and I think uh, the genomic field has, uh, you know, moved that I mean, you can't now publish something that is not replicated and with a large number of subjects and all those things on uh, for GWAS. For instance. And I think we, neuroimaging is hopefully following with that track. And it's just like, you know, we are in a phase where we're, we're still you know, uh, but we have to fight a bit the, uh, the academic system. <laughs> that is the, uh, you know, that you need to, uh, you know, publish a lot and therefore, you know, like, uh, the less uh, subjects you have, the quicker you publish and the better, you know, it is for your career. So we, we need to like uh, have a counter uh, uh, force on, on, on this uh, aspect. Um, Kai, I see you have, you have a hand up. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pauling. My, my question to you is, do, do you think that pre-registration is going to be a common practice uh, at least soon in the near future for all these uh, publications that involve a lot of uh, statistical analysis? And if that's the case, would it be better to uh, involve us statisticians? Because I, I'm not going to pretend that I, although I pr do a lot of statistics, I'm not a statistician. So is it always good to involve it as early as possible? Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, two questions really. Are like, uh, do I think that uh, pre-registration is going to take over the field? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't look like it uh, at the moment. Uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't look like it. Uh, and yeah, that's, uh, I mean, th th there are some very, very really thought, like, uh, so Chris Chambers, for instance, is one of the uh, uh, proponent of uh, an, an early, uh, you know, pusher and good pusher <laughs> on this on this side of things. Um, and uh, so I think uh, when you are the editor of a journal, so he's an editor of a journal, like, uh, he can actually sort of like, you know, push that better. So I think, I think we have to lobby uh, the, uh, the editors and the editorial boards and like you know to uh, to push in that direction um, uh, otherwise i don't think uh, it's going to naturally take it it's going to take some effort to you know, like a, and also it's hard because often people will say oh but my analysis doesn't really fit in that model i, I don't have like a you know uh, you know, it's, it's more exploratory or like, a, it's it's very hard to define exactly what you want to answer. Uh, sometimes in advance, you have a general idea of what you want to study, uh, but you don't often like uh, lay out exactly the, uh, okay, I want to see that's the, uh, what the ratio, is that number going to be bigger than that one, you know? Um, and, uh, so, so yeah, so I'd, yeah, so I'm not super optimistic. I think, I think there's some effort by the community to be done on that side. Uh, and this, uh, the second question, um, uh, sorry, what, what was the second question again? Uh, the, um... And that, that actually leading to the second question and because sometimes I find it very hard to communicate with statisticians. Oh, I see, yeah, 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 yeah. So and, should, and, we, should we involve yes. statisticians uh, right away? No, it's super yeah. hard uh, to communicate with uh, statisticians. Uh, uh, it's very, very hard. Um, it's, uh, it's all, uh, it's, yeah, I think it's it's partly we have going kind of like to uh, sort of like uh, train ourselves to know a bit in that of that field, uh, and uh, and also like you know make sure that you uh, there's enough time invested, uh, and that's the often the problem. Uh, um, and and yeah, uh, on there on on the statistical you know uh, uh, community part. Uh, you know, it's it's complicated. For instance, one of the issue in a, in a biomedical research, for instance, is that the uh, uh, you can't you can't ask for a grant or something without some set of a, a power effect, I'm like power study. But you know, like you have to you have to uh, indicate in your grant, okay. Uh, I expect uh, my study to have a power of, uh, you know, 85% or, <laughs> or more than 80%. And then you have to justify that. Uh, and there was a there was a study. Um, uh, Showing that uh, you know the uh, the advice and the uh, of uh, uh, given by statisticians were really biased in a sense because 
uh, biologist or like a medical uh, uh, community people uh, are pushing such decision really hard to you know they're not following they don't they want they want uh, them to say hey that's fine in the grant but they, they really they, you know they don't survive if they don't have those grants <laughs> so uh, so it, there's a very strong uh, uh, sociological pressure to kind of uh, abuse uh, uh, the advice of a statistician so that's another uh, aspect um, there was a good study on this one. Uh, uh, published in Nature in 2016. Um, yeah, I can put the reference somewhere if you're interested. That would be great. Thank you. I hope I haven't. Uh, I don't want to like uh, be the bearer of only bad news. I think. Uh, I mean. I think it's, it's my 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 talk is really to give you some of some ideas where you know where we, we can improve and and we we have to be careful. And I, I think that's a. Uh, that's really you know what what it is, and also maybe the main message is uh, you know uh, have many subjects in your study, have many like a, a large sample size. It's it's one of the big things that will make a you know your study uh, solid or not. Collaboration is the answer. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure. Uh, is, was that uh, I heard someone talking, but I'm not sure that was a question. He was just commenting that collaboration is is becomes really important. In correct, correct. Uh, collaboration and uh, and open data, op data that are well uh, uh, well created, well well uh, documented, uh, that you know exactly the, the provenance and all those things. Uh, that that uh, that's an important uh, aspect as well. Uh, and the, and the way I think, I mean, the way I'm trying to hack that with I, I and, and many others uh, is to say, you know, data sets or those things are, are things that are important to be published by themselves. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and, and that therefore you get the credit that is important in academia, uh, but also you really do uh, help uh, uh, solid science by releasing those things. Um, I think part of the good news is that that's increasingly accept accepted. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Other than uh, goodwill and uh, maybe a strong moral compass, what do you think could happen in the more uh, institutional, I guess, scale to sort of push good science, that is reproducible science, etc.? Do, do they feel like uh, sometimes to be the, the advocate means you have to swim upstream all the time? Mm -hmm. So, what are your thoughts on that? Um, institutions are tough to hack. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's the proper word, but but you are at the new academy, so uh, uh, that's a good project pitch. <laughs> it's a good project pitch. Yeah. Actually, I do have a project pitch. If, if some people are interested in uh, uh, in uh, making, uh, you know, I've got a couple of uh, notebooks that I will also push in the uh, in the material repo uh, that are demonstrating some of those uh, effects that I'm talking about and things. But if some people are interested in uh, helping me uh, putting uh, making that up to date and better, uh, I've, I've got that uh, project to uh, you know. Uh, Make that uh, those notebooks better. Uh, so if you if one of you is interested in uh, in uh, in doing that, please uh, contact me. Um, yeah, I think I mean my my thinking is that it's it'd be easier for this you know for the new generation and the uh, and the and the scientific community to hack the publication uh, sort of like you know uh, 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 ecosystem rather than to hack the institutions. But one I, I'll tell you one good place where we, we do have a capacity of leverage and uh, is uh, you know when we talk to funders uh, so uh, uh, NIH welcome trust uh, all those like you know uh, you, I mean they they are aware they, uh, they they want to have like a good results and science for their books <laughs> uh, and they and so therefore they 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 probably are, are you know a good target for like you know, for uh, for you know advancing in, in that direction so so I would uh, uh, institution universities i don't know how to do that i mean it's a it's a, it's tough it's a, i mean you can advocate as well you can always like it's always good when you you know you publish a study demonstrating more of the problem or like you know uh, but it's uh, 
yeah, it's it's uh, universities are more followers, uh, I think. 